Hi, I'm Clive Wynn. I'm a professor of psychology at Arizona State University, and my specialty is the behavior of dogs. I teach dog behavior to our students here at ASU, and I also teach a class on edX about dog behavior. So, I wanted to talk about a particular area of dog behavior that I have a lot of people come up and ask me questions about. There's a domain in our understanding of dogs that has become a total battlefield. People have become really up in arms about this topic. And the topic I'm talking about is dominance. Dominance and the arguments about whether dominance exists in dogs, whether it's relevant to our lives with dogs, has become, it's a bloodbath. Why is it so controversial? Well, the discussion of dominance has become controversial in the last decade or so because of this man. Cesar Milan, I know you've already heard of him. He is presently the world's single most commercially successful dog trainer with a very successful television program and a series of books which are always among the top 10 best-selling dogs, best-selling dogs, best-selling books on dog behavior. And Cesar Milan's whole philosophy is that the essence to understanding our lives with dogs and to having successful lives with dogs is to recognize that we dominate our dogs. One of his most popular books is called Be the Pack Leader. That is the essence of Milan's approach. Milan's approach, and it's not just his belief in the notion of dominance, but many elements of Milan's approach have been widely criticized and criticized by a number of highly respected professional organizations. So, for example, the Association, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior has three times issued press releases saying that Milan's approach is wrong and begging National Geographic to take him off the television. That's an American group. A British group, the Association of Pet Behavior Counselors, has likewise repeatedly taken the position that Milan's approach, his emphasis on dominance, is wrong. The Huffington Post has published articles arguing that Cesar Milan's approach to dog training is nothing but some good timing and some hard kicks in the stomach. And I was even, I'm surprised to say, I was, I was surprised to find that there is a whole website dedicated to trying to debunk Cesar Milan, calls itself Beyond Cesar Milan. And it says it's dedicated to bringing together people who oppose cruel, violent, or bullying methods of training or rehabilitating dogs. So my goodness, this is a very, very fraught area. And I think that as a professor of psychology specializing in dog behavior, it's my duty to attempt to help you to find a clear path through what has become a very controversial area. You may have already taken a class in animal behavior. Most university biology departments offer such a class. And in that class, you may have come across the concept of dominance as it is understood in animal behavior. You may not even remember, because this isn't an especially hotly contested area of science. Dominance in animal behavior is a widely accepted concept that's been around for a very long time. Now, I know you should never do this. You should never show people a slide that is just packed with text. But I have a point in doing this. My point is just to show you that you can easily find pages, chapters in university textbooks on animal behavior dedicated to explaining what dominance means in animal behavior. And here is one example. I mean, there are dozens or hundreds of these examples. And I'll read you a little bit of what it says. In ethology, ethology is the biological study of animal behavior. In ethology, dominance refers to superior position in a rank order or social hierarchy. An individual to which another consistently gives way is said to be dominant in the relationship, the other being subordinate or subdominant. In a linear hierarchy, each individual is dominant over those below it and subordinate to those above it. 
with the exceptions of the alpha animal, who is subordinate to none, and the omega animal, who is dominant over none. And then it goes on, social hierarchies can be more complicated, and so dominance is relative to individual relationships. Complications can arise if individuals form alliances, and these kinds of situations do happen in primates. Uh, you can get subdivisions according to sex and age status. Dominant status is not static. It varies from time to time in groups. Lower ranking of animals may test the ability of those ranking above them. Dominance ranking may vary in context, so that who gives way to whom may not be the same in all situations. And so, there it is. It's straight out of a textbook. This is a relatively old textbook. I just happen to like this one. You can find this in the most recent editions of the most modern textbooks. There is nothing controversial, nothing even, you could say, exciting about the concept of dominance as it is generally understood in the study of animal behavior. And just to make sure that we have the essence of the concept in front of us, dominance exists in social animals. If you're a solitary animal, you don't have the opportunity to experience dominance. It's about how individuals in a group of animals control each other's access to the things that matter to them. It implies societies that are more or less hierarchical. And you already knew about the concept of hierarchies in animal societies because the term pecking order is a term that exists in the common language you don't have to have studied to know about the term pecking order. And yet this whole concept has become so controversial in the domain of dogs that I've actually come across people on the internet who have tried to argue that dominance theory was invented by the Nazis, which I think is a terrible insult to the Norwegian, whose name is written on this slide, who actually first published a scientific paper on the concept of dominance in 1921. And because I don't speak Norwegian, I have been in touch with a Norwegian friend who will pronounce the name for us. That's his name, Torleif Schildrup Ebbe. I did the best I could. So now that we have a basic understanding of what is meant by dominance when people study the behavior of animals, let's stop and think for a moment about the relationship that we have with our dogs. Here are some questions that get at whether we control our dog's access to important resources or vice versa. So, you're going for a walk with your dog. Your dog wants to go this way, but actually you need to go that way. What happens? Do you go this way with your dog? Or do you go this other way, the way that you need to be going? Now, I'm not saying every time, but on balance, is there a consistent pattern in your life with your dog? Does your dog consistently tell you where you're going for a walk? Or do you tell your dog more often than not where you're going for a walk? Many people nowadays keep their dogs in cages, which we call crates. Do you put your dog in a crate? Or does your dog put you in a cage? Which of these two things happens? Who controls, who decides in that context? Among your dog and yourself, do you tell your dog where it is appropriate to carry out toileting functions? Or does your dog tell you where you may carry out toileting functions? Which of those is the case? You and your dog, when your dog's hungry, does your dog simply decide what, where and when he shall eat? Or do you make that decision for your dog? Which of those occurs? Many of us have had our dogs spayed or neutered. Has your dog had you spayed or neutered? And then there are dogs that are sexually intact. They have not been spayed or neutered. Who decides with whom the dog shall mate? Do you make those decisions for your dog? Or does your dog make those decisions for you? Now, I'm going to take a punt here. I think I know the answers you gave. I think I know the answer you gave to every one of these questions. 
I think that although there may be occasions where your dog wants to go that way and you would rather go this way, but it doesn't matter all that much, there may be occasions that you go where your dog seems to want to go. But on balance, your dog does not choose where you go for a walk. You choose. I choose. Certainly, I'm confident that your dog does not get you to get inside a cage. I'm confident your dog doesn't tell you where to pee and poop. I'm pretty confident that you control what your dog eats and when and how much and not the other way around. I'm 100% confident, I dread to even think what it might imply, 100% confident that you decided your dog should be spayed or neutered, not the other way around. And by and large, intact dogs do not get their own free choice of who they shall mate with. Human beings make those decisions for them. So I'm here to tell you that you do exert dominance over your dog. You do control your dog's access to most all of the resources that matter to your dogs. So let's back up. Dominance, I said dominance occurs in social species, social species that repeatedly interact with each other, and where among those interactions there are consistent winners and losers. I don't say you have to fight. You don't have to fight your dog to determine when, where, and what your dog eats. You don't get aggressive with your dog. Dominance and aggression are two quite different concepts. But there are repeated interactions between you and your dog, and the outcome is that you consistently win in those interactions. You choose the food your dog will eat. You control your dog's sex life. You control your dog's control access to territory, where the dog will rest, safe, sheltered areas. You restrict your dog's movement. Your dog is not a free agent. Even competition for attention, your dog may want you to pay attention and you control whether you pay attention or not. And the outcome of these kinds of situations is, as I said, a hierarchical society. Now, not all animals are social. Not all social animals experience dominance and have hierarchical societies. Let's just talk about the carnivores, the order carnivora. That's the biological high-level grouping to which dogs belong. But not all carnivores are even social. Some carnivores are asocial. Leopards, tigers, they don't form social groups. So the notion of dominance has no relevance to them. Some social animals are hierarchical, and good examples of hierarchical social animals are wolves and spotted hyenas. But not all social animals are hierarchical. A good example of a non-hierarchical group of social animals are lions. And here I just put up the uh, title page from a fairly recent 2001 uh, research paper from the journal Science on egalitarianism in female African lions. Lions are big, fierce, nasty animals, but they're not hierarchical. They do not experience dominance. They are, in fact, egalitarian. So the notion of hierarchy, which is what you need to experience dominance, and the notion of nastiness are two quite different notions. You don't have to be aggressive to be hierarchical, and just because you're aggressive, that doesn't mean you will be hierarchical. So, not all animals are social, and not all social animals experience dominance. Let's talk about styles of dominance. The worst case, one might say the worst case, is called despotic Dominance. A despotic social group is a social group where one member is in charge and dominates everybody else. And wolves are in that category, gorillas, meerkats, a couple of other species that fall in that category. Another possibility is more like the pecking order idea, where somebody beats somebody else, and that somebody else beats somebody else, and so on down the chain. That is called linear dominance. And hyenas are a good example of linear dominance. And then just for completeness sake, let me mention again that you can have a style of dominance that is no dominance. You can have an egalitarian 
social structure, and I already mentioned lions and bonobos, uh, pygmy chimpanzees, are another example of a largely egalitarian society. Let's pause for a moment and ponder our own species. Are we human beings typically hierarchical? Well, the answer is that human beings in different human societies take many, many different forms. And there are relatively egalitarian societies. Uh, we tend to think of our own in the West, democracies are relatively egalitarian, through to very despotic and hierarchical societies. A paper that came out just last year, 2015, in the journal Nature, mentioned that ritual human sacrifice promoted and sustained the evolution of stratified societies. This was in Central America. So there's, there have been human societies that are quite despotic, stratified, hierarchical, and there are others that are less so. Um, what's the point of dominance? Well, there can be benefits to being in charge. In biology, the ultimate benefit is reproductive success, having the most children. And a study on bonnet macaques found that in a group, three of the males were the fathers of three quarters of all of the offspring, and their offspring were more likely to survive. The present king of Saudi Arabia has 25 brothers and 42 sisters, so it seems like there was a reproductive benefit to his father being the king of that rather hierarchical society. You can have reproductive success, you may have foraging success. Dominant individuals tend to get more food and water, and that's been observed in baboons and birds. But we shouldn't talk only about the benefits of being dominant. There are costs to being the dominant individual as well. Dominant individuals have been found to hold higher levels of stress hormones. It's stressful being the boss. And um, in a study on birds, it was found that uh, birds of higher rank needed more food, needed more energy to maintain their rank. And again, if you want to think about human societies, I can recommend a wonderful novel for you. Henderson, the Rain King by Saul Bellow is a wonderful story of an American who more or less by accident becomes the chief of an African tribe and discovers that there are very substantial costs to being the dominant individual. So I said that dominance and aggression are two different things, but dominance does occur in the context of what are called agonistic behaviors, which are competitive behaviors. They don't have to be fights. They can be threats. They can be displays that indicate high rank in a way that is understood by other individuals. So red stags, for example, have roaring contests. They can't hurt each other by roaring, but the roaring communicates their status in a way that other individuals understand. Dominance appears because of asymmetries between individuals. Asymmetries in how well individuals can hold on to resources, which is where physical strength may really matter. But it can also come about for other reasons, such as individuals valuing the same resource differently. And so my phone is probably more valuable to me than it is to you, because here I have so many things that I need, so much information that I need, that it's more valuable to me than it is to you. And so I might be willing to put up more of a fight to keep it than you would to take it. Uh, that's not so far away from the notion of home advantage, that an individual can have can be dominant in their in their home context just because they understand it better and they know their way around better and so on. One of the complaints that's made about discussions of dominance is that people often talk as if a desire to be dominant is part of an individual's personality. We don't have any evidence of that, and it isn't technically correct to talk in those terms. But it is reasonable to say that assertiveness can be a personality trait, and assertiveness may correlate with dominance in particular situations. Dominance, as I think I already mentioned, can depend on the context and the situation so that one individual may be dominant, say, in 
contests over food, and another individual might be dominant in contests over sexual access. They are, dominance can depend on the context. Dogs, as I'm sure you know, are descended from wolves. Dogs and wolves have very different social structures, and yet nonetheless, discussion of wolf social structure has been brought in to discussions of dog social structure and dog-human relationships. And there is a quote from the foremost wolf behavioral researcher of our times that is often used in this context. David Meech, oh, I'm sorry, I first of all have this photograph of a woman bowing to a killer whale. A bow is a human um, behavior display that communicates subordinates. Don't know why she's communicating this to a killer whale, but she is. Okay, this is David Meech, as I say, the foremost behavioral researcher on wolves of our time. And some time ago in 1999, he criticized a view that had grown up that wolves are continuously competing for status. He critiqued the view that a wolf pack was a group of individuals ever vying for dominance, held in check by the alpha pair, the alpha male, and the alpha female. Now, I don't want to go into too much of the background of this, but David Meech was critiquing a view of wolf behavior that had arisen through the study of captive wolves, and he was contrasting it with the understanding of wolves that he had developed by studying free-living wolves. Free-living wolves spend very much less time in conflict than do captive groups of wolves. So he was criticizing this view that a group of wolves are always vying for dominance. But... He never said that wolves do not live in social groups that experience dominance. On the contrary, in a later paper from 2010, he wrote, Dominance is one of the most pervasive and important behaviors among wolves in a pack. Okay, so that's wolves. Wolves do experience dominance. They live in groups where dominance is one of the most pervasive and important experiences. Now, a large part of why people critique Cesar Milan is because of his use of aversive consequences, because he uses pain to control the behavior of dogs. What does a discussion of dominance have to do with aversive consequences? In itself, it doesn't necessarily have to do the two concepts, dominance and aversion, do not necessarily have to have anything to do with each other. Dominance and the use of aversive consequences are two distinct consequences. You assert dominance over your dog because you control your dog's access to food, to shelter, and possibly to sex. You, how do you control your dog's access to food? You don't growl at your dog. You don't try and bite your dog. You have no need to use anything painful over your dog in order to control its access to food. You control your dog's access to food because you have the can opener, you have the thumb and fingers that you can use to pull open bags of dog food. You can place bags of dog food on high shelves where dogs cannot possibly get at them. How do you control your dog's access to shelter? You control your dog's access to shelter because you can operate door handles and you can close your dog into certain spaces, shut your dog out of other spaces. Has nothing to do with aggression. You don't growl at your dog when you're doing this. How do you control your dog's access to sex? Well, I leave that as a homework exercise. We don't need to really talk about that. The essential essence here is that you do not control your dog's access to critical things by any form of aversive experience at all, you do this because you have a big brain and you can think of ways of controlling your dog's access to things that your dog cannot puzzle its way through. Your dog cannot puzzle out a way to open a door. Your dog just cannot do it. Your dog cannot think of a way to open a can of dog food. Just can't do it. Can't even open the fridge. So it's your big brain and your opposable thumb that give you dominance over your dog. And it doesn't matter what your attitude is to the concept of dominance, and it doesn't matter how much you love your dog and never want your dog to experience anything negative. You are dominating your dog because with your big brain 
and your thumb and your ability to manipulate things with your hands, you control your dog's access to crucial resources. That is dominance. Now, I said that the concept of dominance and the concept of aversive control have nothing to do with each other. And yet, I must confess that when you talk to trainers who discuss the concept of dominance, it does seem that they are more likely to be interested in using aversive consequences, like hitting and kicking, a choke chain, a shock collar. There certainly is, as we go around the world, an interrelatedness of these ideas. I'm just telling you that at the level of scientific analysis, they don't have to have anything to do with each other. Okay, so far, all I've been really doing is laying the groundwork, convincing you that no matter what your attitude to your dog may be, you do dominate your dog. But there are a lot of open questions. For example, do dogs have a social structure among themselves that is hierarchical? That's an open question. Do mixed dog-human households have a hierarchical structure? There's never been a study on it. I think it's pretty clear from what I've already said and the questions I asked you about how your life with your dog goes along that we do. What would it mean to dominate a dog? What would your dog perceive as dominance in your behavior? That's a curious question. It's never really even been asked. And the final question is, can you control your dog's behavior by dominating it, asserting your higher status? That's the assumption that Cesar Millar makes. He assumes, he asserts, that if you just convey to your dog that you are the boss, your dog will say, okay, he's the boss. We've got to do what he says. Nobody's ever actually studied that. And it's quite an interesting question. Now, the first question has only ever been assessed in one scientific study, which only came out last year. And the answer is yes. It's a really interesting study. A group in the Netherlands studied a bunch of dogs and video recorded everything they did and found that they did, in fact, have a dominance hierarchy, a hierarchical social structure. And certain behaviors among the dogs indicated dominant status and subordinate status. And I think you'd be at least somewhat surprised by what these behaviors are. The two best indicators of dominance were muzzle bite. That's where a dog or a wolf puts its muzzle, puts its mouth over the muzzle of another dog. It's not a hard bite. It's not even necessarily much of a bite at all. It's just taking the other's muzzle in your mouth. And the second one is high posture. Dominant animals pull themselves up to their full height. And that is a symptom, a symbol, a behavior that projects dominance. Subordinates, submission indicators. A tail wag, taking a low posture, passing underneath the head of another dominant animal and licking the corners of the mouth of the other animal. Now this is very interesting because some people like to let their, a lot of dogs, my own dog, is very inclined to lick at people's mouths. And some people like that. They like being kissed by a dog. What an interesting thought that that might be a behavior that your dog is using to communicate her submission to you. Now, I won't go into all the details of this paper, but it's interesting to note that with the technique that they have, you can actually measure how hierarchical dog society is. You can use this method on any species. It's been used on a variety of different animals, birds, monkeys. Dogs had a quite clearly hierarchical social structure, but not as bad as some others like certain species of monkey. And oh, this is a guy letting his dog kiss him, lick him on the mouth, which from the dog's perspective may be a submission indicator. So the dog's dominant style was tolerant on a scale that goes despotic, tolerant, relaxed, egalitarian. So the dogs were fairly, but not extremely hierarchical in their social structure. So this is an enormously exciting step forward that we at last have a study that gets at the hierarchical social structure 
that forms in a group of dogs. So, to go back to those open questions, do dogs have a hierarchical social structure among themselves? Yes, they do. Do mixed dog-human households have a hierarchical social structure? Nobody has studied this as a scientific study, but on the basis of asking ourselves, do we control our dog's access to critical resources? The answer must be yes. What does it mean to dominate a dog? What ritualized behavior might a dog perceive as us asserting our dominance over them? This has never been studied, but if we take the results of the Dutch study that looked at the social structure of a group of dogs living among themselves without people, it's possible that each time we stand up, the dog perceives us as asserting our dominance because we are, we are reaching a higher stature than the dog could possibly reach. That might be us asserting our dominance. Or when your dog wants to lick your lips to kiss you, our accepting those kisses could be us asserting our higher social rank. We don't know. We really need to do those studies. And that final question, which is the essence of Cesar Milan's approach to dog training, that you can control your dog by making sure it knows you are the boss, we have no idea. There is nothing I can think of that speaks to that assertion. So, to sum up, yes, we do dominate our dogs. Yes, our dogs are animals that recognize a hierarchical social structure. But what that then implies for how we live with our dogs and how we might train our dogs, it's largely unstudied. Certainly, one thing we can be sure of is that we do not gain anything by being mean to our dogs in an attempt to further convince them that we are in charge. This whole alpha role nonsense, there is nothing in that. If you operate the can opener, and control your dog's access to food, if you close the door and control your dog's access to to territory, if you control what matters in your dog's life, then you are as dominant over your dog as you possibly can be, and there is nothing to be said for trying to intensify that. So, to conclude, why is this such a hot area of debate? I think that debates are hottest where the facts are leanest. As I said, the study that looked at the social structure of dogs, that was only published less than 12 months ago. And so in an area where you have a vacuum of knowledge, assertion becomes loudest and controversy becomes loudest. So I hope that I've helped some in laying out a scientific basis for understanding dominance in dogs. As I said, my name's Clive Wynn. I'm a professor at Arizona State University. If this kind of thing interests you, then let me encourage you to sign up for the class that I have on offer at edX, which is actually a series of, at the moment, three classes that look at the whole range of questions circling on dog behavior and cognition. Thank you very much.